What's that like? What's going on, people? Hey, it's another edition of the What's That Like podcast, and I'm your host, John Knowles. So once again, we're back. Uh, If you've noticed, we're probably in about every two-week rotation with the show, and I can't say enough about the episode we've got upcoming here. Tremendous, you know, anticipation to this one. Uh, We're going to be talking about the Benelde Coliseum. Now, if you're from central Illinois and you've grown up here, and, and unless you were born in the last 15, 20 years... You probably have some memory in some way, shape, or form of the Benel Coliseum. Uh, The people that have grown up in this area their whole lives kind of became a centerpiece of a lot of the social activity they partake in as they were growing up and certainly into their adult years and became an icon for many of the generations in central Illinois. And when I started this podcast, it was one of those things It's like if I wrote down a list of all the things I wanted to get covered from a historical perspective, this one was at the top. Well, anyway, about a year ago, my friend Monty Brown said, uh, if you want to talk about that, there's only one guy you got to talk to, and that's Jim Marcacci. So he gave me his name. I sent him a message on Facebook. And the way Facebook kind of works is that if you're not like Facebook friends, you might not see that message. So it took Jim about a year to see it. I'd sent him multiple messages, no response. And he finally got back to me. He goes, oh, hey, just found this. You still interested? I'm like, well, hell yeah. So he got his partner, John Eubin who uh, is working with him on the Benelde Coliseum documentary. They've actually been working on this for the better part of a decade. Anyway, they agreed to come over this past week and and just go over the history of that iconic building here in central Illinois and how it's tied to organized crime. Will it ever be rebuilt? I mean, all kinds of questions we got into. And, of course, certainly the acts that came through there. list too long to mention. If you want to check out a 12-minute clip of the documentary, uh, it's out there on YouTube. Search for Memories of the Coliseum. Great show. Couldn't couldn't wait for this one. This was one, like I said, that was on the top of my list for years. So i um, looking forward to bringing you that. This past week uh, became a turning point here at the What's That Like podcast. And I say this all the time. The, the, the podcast is free to you. Always will be. It's just not free to produce. And for a while, over the last year, I've been pretty much funding this thing out of pocket to make sure that it's out there and getting to you. But it kind of got to a point where if we're going to keep doing it, we've got to really kind of bring in a little bit of revenue. So, you know, one of the things that I've been kicking around is do I want to do ads? And, you know, ads on a podcast are kind of a cool thing. You put an ad on the radio, first time they mention you, it's gone. It's it's in the air and it's it's never heard again. You put an ad in a newspaper, it gets read once, gets thrown out. An ad on a podcast lives almost forever. And on a show like ours, we get lots of, I won't say repeat listens, but listens that come well beyond the time of when it initially goes out there. So uh, what I've been able to do is basically create a, a, a an ad model for you. If you want ads that you want to run on the show, it certainly is something that we can do. And the thing about it is you only pay for the first couple of weeks that it's out there, but your ad lives forever. It's an evergreen sponsorship model. Once it's set in stone, it's there. And as many of you know that if you discovered the show recently, you can go back a year and a half and listen to an episode, and they're still very timely in terms of story and content. But there's that ad there as well. It'll continue to always be there. It's one of those things that I've kind of struggled with and decided, you know, it's probably time to go ahead and start doing. And I want to bring on our first couple of sponsors for the audio show. We're not going to pepper the whole show full of ads. I promise you we'll we'll never do more than three in any show. But we've got two right here at the start. And first, I want to thank my longtime friend, James Labonte. Labonte Photography. You can actually go back and listen to an episode of his that uh, aired last fall. And it's still out there. Like I said, it's evergreen. And James has uh, has a photography business that's kind of twofold. Number one, you can get your picture taken. He does a great job. He's got uh, the ability to really take anywhere. He's got a lot of locations he uses. Uh, he's been doing this for like 15, 20 years. Very passionate man about what he does with his photography. He does a lot of work. And he does a great job on any type of photography that you might be interested in. Weddings, uh, senior pictures, family photos, you know, whatever it is it might be. He does a great job at that. Part two of that is in this do-it-yourself era... People are always going, well, I'll just buy a camera. I can take photos or I want to do that. But they have no idea how to use that camera. He teaches classes. So it's kind of a twofold thing. Whether you want him to do it professionally, that's great. 
But if you want to learn how you can do it and take pictures in a more professional manager, James can help you with that as well. So Labonte Photography, can't thank them enough for coming on. And number two, uh, probably a guy I've known for the better part of 45 years of my life, and that's Mike Belovich. Uh, we grew up together in Staunton. He's a real estate agent with Remax Alliance, and he's been doing a great job serving all the citizens of Central Illinois with their real estate needs for a long, long time time and mike had called and said you know i understand that this is something that's going to be different he wants to differentiate himself in the marketplace he's got uh, uh, a lot of things he wants to get out there and make sure that the public is aware of everything that he can do and we're happy to bring mike on board and and have his support as well as we start this next phase of the what's that like podcast uh, by bringing some of these folks on so Certainly support both those folks, uh, James Labonte, Labonte Photography, and Mike Belovich with Remax Alliance. Uh, great partners. I'm happy to have them on board, and I think you'll enjoy having them around, too. And uh, finally, for the opening show notes here, a uh, w- big shout-out to Randy Bursch at Turner Fest. We're having the second annual Turner Fest here in Mount Olive. Live music, 12 hours all day. You know, closing with the Jeremiah Johnson Band right here in Mount Olive at Neiman Park. And yours truly... We'll be the host of the day. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm honored he asked me to do that and come out and kind of MC the event. It's uh, not something I've done before, but we're going to take the challenge and we'll probably do a little live podcasting and maybe some audio podcasts. We'll see what kind of comes out of the day. But I plan on spending uh, the better part of the whole day out there and, and MCing the show and just uh, having some fun. And I think you will too. There's food trucks, there's kids' day, there's, there's like the dancing bears and. There's all kinds of stuff that's going on out there that I think you're really going to enjoy. So come on out. Turner Fest, September 15th, Saturday, 12 noon. As Randy always says, bring a chair. Bring a lawn chair and plan on spending some time. Here it is. Story of the Coliseum with Jim Marcacci and John Eubin, creators of the documentary Memories of the Coliseum. I I wanted to talk to these guys for so long and just find out, you know, everything there was about the Benoit Coliseum. What was that like? Jim, John, welcome to Studio 312. How are you guys doing today? We're doing Good. great. Glad to be here. It's a, Thanks it's, for having us. Yeah, it's phenomenal to get you finally in here. I think it's great. What's the connection that you guys have to the Coliseum? Oh, I just loved to go there when I was a kid. <laughs> I never played any music. Yeah. But I like to listen to it, and I like the groups, and uh, it just... It was a fascination. I, I grew up in Sarville, and I had to go past that place every time I went to Benel yeah. for Glisby. And, oh, it's just been a icon to to myself and to everybody that's been by it. Oh, or yeah. in it. John, what would you say to that? I grew up about two miles down the road. I remember getting up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom and seeing all these cars. And my mother said, well, they're leaving Tarot's. As I got older, I realized what Tarot's was, that it was a dance hall. Uh-huh. Couldn't wait to get there. And I started going out there, I guess I was 15. Yeah. Can I name names here? Jim McKay. He used to, we, he, <laughs> he had his mom's station wagon, and he'd pick us up. And he had a place he could get served. So we would go out, and a quart of beer was 50 cents at that time. So we each give him a dollar. He'd come back with an arms full of beer. Uh-huh. Then go to the Coliseum. Because you could get served there if you were brave. I wasn't brave enough because so everybody knew who I was, and everybody knew who Jim's dad was, but by when two quarts of beer at 15, you don't need any more. You're, you're plenty silly. <laughs> now, kiddies, it's a different time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you're listening today, that was kind of the norm back then. But the yeah. first band I heard yeah. there was the jor from the, Highland. Okay. Yeah. And uh, saw a lot of stuff about 1964 or 65 was when I started going out there. 64, 60. Jim, what was the first year you went there? God, I saw Fats Domino out there. It was probably around 60. Yeah. I saw him the second time he was there. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's get into kind of the history of the place. So you, you called it a second ago, John, you called it Taros. And the reason it was called Taros is because a guy named Dominic Taro built the place, right? Yeah. And all the locals just always called it Taros. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to Taros on Saturday night. I'm yeah. going to Taros. When was the, the Taros, the Coliseum, built? It was built in 1924. Dominic had a place on North Main Street in Benelt. Mm-hmm. It was a skating rink hall, and it burned down along with the Benelt Enterprise in 1923, December, I believe. And he said, I'm going to build one bigger and better, and it's going to be made out of brick because it's not going to burn down. <laughs> Ouch. He had it built within a year, and December, Christmas Eve. Christmas, Christmas night. Christmas night. Christmas night. Uh, 1924, they opened it up with Frank Westfall. And guess where Frank was from? Where was Frank from? 
Chicago. Yeah? Hot, <laughs> hot band in Chicago. Yeah, very hot. So very I think popular. you're telling me it was from Chicago because there may have been a connection. Which, yeah, there, there well, are, you have to wonder why yeah. the hottest band in Chicago was in Little Bitty Tiny Benilde on Christmas yeah. night. During I think it, Prohibition. It was an offer he probably couldn't be refused. Yeah. yeah. Rumor, no, there, there are rumors, and you can never substantiate any of these rumors, but it has been claimed by more than one person that Al Capone helped fund the place. To give credence to that might be the fact that it cost fifty thousand dollars to build in nineteen twenty four. And in today's money, that's seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And that seems even light to build a building of that size, yeah. Architectural firm of Edward Kane out of Edwardsville uh, did the plans and built the place and uh ten thousand square foot dance floor, the largest between St. Louis and Chicago. Now you you brought up that Capone may or may not have funded it. There's, there's help. Could yeah. be some credence. Dominic, we know he was he was independently wealthy. I mean, he he was a wealthy man by that time. How? What was his background? Uh, grocery business. Grocery business. <laughs> well, my, they sold a lot of sugar. Yeah. <laughs> to the to the people of Macoupin and Montgomery counties, yeah. both. And he it, was a he was a linchpin. Yeah. Now, 1923, 24, when this is built. Prohibition is three years old. That came yes. in in 20, right? Right. 1920. Yeah. yeah. Right. In Beneld, and kind of offline, we, we were talking a second ago, John, you, you had called Beneld what? In 1931, it was the wickedest city in America, yeah. according to the uh, Wickersham Report, which is a national study. And it was kind of Vegas before there was Vegas, right? Long exactly. before. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Dominic may have been involved. Oh, well, yeah. I shouldn't even say may. Yeah. He was involved in a lot of the, yeah. the yeah. selling the supplies to well, supply I think, I think liquor. I think him spending that much money to open that place in 1923, 24 shows you how indicative people it was. People hated prohibition. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when, when prohibition came in, it increased the amount of people drinking. It didn't decrease it one bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody... You know, it's that golden cookie. Give somebody a cookie, pull it away, they're going to reach for it every time. Yeah. <laughs> now, you know, this is, this is Prohibition, and he builds a 10,000-square-foot dance floor with three bars. Yeah. He wasn't planning on serving lemonade. And they didn't. No. No. Yeah. And they didn't. And um, So the people of Macoupin County, law enforcement at the time, was this uh, a look uh, the other way, a payola yeah. thing? What do you think? They yeah. looked the other way, and they got some of them got paid. And yeah, it may, uh, Prohibition wasn't real popular in Benalta. Or the county. <laughs> yeah. Really. Or anywhere. Well, the government yeah. hired, what, 1,200 agents nationwide and expected local and state enforcement to, to, to enforce it. And yeah. the local and state guys said, Psh, they want prohibition, let the feds enforce it. Because most of these people were their friends or neighbors, you know, right. and uh, it was just all over the place. Yeah. All over the place. The Benel was what? Mining town? Yes, it was a mining town. In fact, well, there were, there were actually no mines in Benel, or near it, oh, but near it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was Sawyerville, Eagerville, uh, Montclair, and, and Wilsonville. Mm-hmm. Those were the four mines of the Superior Coal Company. Well, at first, it was just Montclair, Sawyerville, and Eagerville, and Benel was built because it was centrally located between the three, and anybody living in Benel could walk to any one of those three different mines. And uh, yeah. that's why, but that's when... Benel came about because of the mines. Yeah. Those three superior coal mines. And in 1912, they said Benel has had 1,200 people and 22 taverns. <laughs> they used to say Benel has 22 taverns and 22 whorehouses. <laughs> and gambling well, was rampant. Well, you had a lot of young men coming in. They needed stuff to do. Sure. Yes. Or they wanted stuff to they do. They were young, virile, yeah. energetic, working yeah. hard, and... Uh, this would have been right after World War One. No, right after no, World this War. This was I. before, oh. before and then before. after. Yeah. 19, okay. Yeah, and, and and I mean there was no prohibition at the time, and I mean alcohol ran free. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just, but it was a wild town because of the three mines. Yeah. So Dominic's there. He's got his market. You right. know what the market is. His first place burns down. Then He's he, going to build the bigger and better one. And what happened to Dominic? Dominic ran into a little bit of bad luck. Uh, <laughs> he was the linchpin for organized crime in Montgomery and Macoupin counties. Okay. At least, at least as far as we can determine. Yeah. Okay, because oh, like I said, that, nothing's so. nothing's proven. Nothing. You didn't talk. You didn't talk around that. And yeah. it's a hundred years ago now. Yeah, the living right. witnesses are few, and, few and far between. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the Treasury Department got a hold of the information that Dominic Terrell was. He was the main man. And so he was uh, asked to come to Springfield to testify and to bring his books. And he never made it home. No. He they put found down $15,500 bond. Huge money back then. His car was found the next day in the middle of the highway, burnt, 
bullet riddled. And Provine and uh, Eaton, the deputy probation commissioner and the state's attorney up there, thought he staged the whole thing, was hiding out somewhere. They kept the case open. That was in uh, December. December. Of when he went, when he disappeared. Was that of 29? 29. And they found the body in April floating in the Sangamon River. Of 1930. 30. Yep. Yeah. He had been heavy wired, been round around his neck, under his knees, and pulled tight together. Feet were bound. He was thrown in the river alive. Wow. They found the body. They pulled him out. The sheriff later said there was nothing more than a skeleton when they got him. So nobody nobody was testifying there. They sent yeah. a message. This yeah. is what happens if you talk. He was going to turn over his books and become a witness for the state. And to this day, people in Benel don't talk. He was the first one to be identified by dental records. Yep. First in the state of Illinois. It was brand new technology then. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Well, he was selling his grocery store. They were selling an inordinate amount of, of sugar. The sugar was coming in on the rail cars, 10 cars at a time, and each 800, 900 sacks of sugar in each car. Yeah. The rumors were that he kept some sugar back for himself because he had stills out behind the Coliseum. A friend of mine's mother, uh, who's now deceased, said she went out there as a little girl picking blackberries one day, and uh, some guys with guns chased him off and said, don't come back. That's a warning. Yeah. And they didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but he was Blackberries aren't that good. No. Yeah, yeah he, he was selling the sugar, and he kept, the rumors are that he kept some back for himself. There was also rumors that he they didn't want to pay him for one big shipment or something. But when he went to see the uh, lawyer, put his bond down, he didn't saw him again. Hmm. They were afraid he was going to squeal. But that funeral was one of the largest this county, this Cuban County has ever seen. People came from Colorado and Chicago, and you're talking back then. Huge funeral. Uh, you're talking by train, you know. And, and they, uh, the newspapers in something like, gosh, 10 states or something reported his death. So he must have been a lot larger than people realized. He had a lot of properties in Bedell. Yeah. He owned the wind-up, one of the premier t- uh, evening establishments uh, just <laughs> south of the South parking lot. They called them bootlegging establishments and lawless resorts. <laughs> That's they did. a nice they way to say it. They called them resorts. <laughs> and soda shops. Yes. <laughs> so Dominic dies in 1930. So then I assume... 20, more than likely 29, but they found yeah, him in 30. They found him yeah. in 30. Yeah. Yeah. Then... I assume his wife took the place over. Right. Is yeah. that is that yeah. kind of where the story picks his, up again? His wife, Marie, took it over. Mm-hmm. Uh, at first, she had people managing it for her, and she just simply had the ownership. And then in 33, she married a guy from California, J.C. Newman, who owned a couple of restaurants, nightclubs out there. And uh, they had a whirlwind uh, romance and marriage in Las Vegas and uh, came back, and he managed the... Coliseum until their marriage went south, and then she married another guy from Glesby, and they were married until he died. And then she died in 55, and that's when Joyce... Joyce the daughter. Joyce the daughter, the famous... Yeah. Joyce Tarot. The famous yeah. Joyce Tarot. Yeah, so she takes it over in 55 right. and ran it until... 76. 1976. She got shot until, and killed. Until she was murdered in 76. So tell me about that night. That was what? February 15th, 19... 19- 17 Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Okay. Yeah. The guild was on stage, as they had been every Saturday night for four years. And, and they were the house band at the time? They were incredible, yes. They were the yeah. house yeah. band. They played yeah. every Saturday night, just them, for four years, and they drew crowds like the National Acts. I mean, it'd be a thousand people every Saturday night mm-hmm. for a local band. And who was in the guild? A bunch well. of guys from around Belleville, Mascuda area. Mm-hmm. Rich Lang, Jim Lang, uh, Tammy Milano from Collinsville, Bill Elkis from Collinsville. They were great. They were the they were the monster. Michael band McBon- Michael, Michael McDonald, McDonald played for him oh. later. Yeah, yeah, from the Deweys. Yes. Yeah. yeah, before yeah. he went yeah. off to L.A., he was in yeah. the band for a few months. I was good friends with the guys, and I'd take my car out there about two thirty three in the afternoon, drop it off, and I'd park back where they parked with the with the trucks and stuff. Where yeah, I'd have my sister take me home. Then I call somebody, one of the guys in the band, or somebody's, hey, pick me up, take me out, and I, my car was already there. Oh yeah, it was just packed every night. Okay, so so that's going on that Saturday night, Valentine's oh, yeah. Day. She always had a couple yeah. drinks after work, and she always took the money home in a gym bag because she knew enough not to try to count it when she's had a couple. Mm-hmm. And she didn't want the bank. To count it without her counting at first. Yeah. yeah. And she walked in to her house with her roommate, Patty, and there were people in the house. She oh, yeah. sent Patty for help. She had a, had a pistol. She had a twenty five caliber in her hip. Yeah. And she had a thirty eight. always carried a thirty eight in her money bag. And she went in with yeah. her thirty eight, I believe, because she yeah. saw the door had been jimmied. And she looked into her bedroom and she saw somebody in there. She started shooting. Yelling at him, get the hell out of my house. It was a, it was a gal. A gal that I had taught in high school. Really? <laughs> yeah. The guy was behind her in a 
came out of the john with a nine millimeter, emptied it in her and killed her instantly. Yeah, that was a bad night. Were they local folks? You said one was, yeah. at one, least. Well, one was from uh, Litchfield. One was actually, I believe, from Decatur. Yeah. They caught him within about a week. How did that go down? How did they catch him? Uh, they had they took some little kid from Decatur with them or Litchfield with them, and he got like, yeah, I want to go back home. You know? <laughs> they were out in Oklahoma. So uh, they drop him off and let him call home, and they t- got caught. So he spilled the whole thing on yeah. basically. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's just no thinking here. So they went to jail and Yeah, yeah they're all yeah, out. Yeah. They're all they're all out now. Gotcha. That was a long time ago. It was forty years ago. So yeah. So that's a famous event. Oh yeah. Obviously. Yeah. We uh-huh. think it was the last gangland style killing in, in Benilde. There were still some more mysterious kind of deaths, but nothing so brazen and so gangland style as, as Joyce's murder. They obviously had to know that was the that was the procedure. She would take well, it they home. Some, yeah, they, yeah, everybody everybody knew Joyce took her money home. She talked about it. I mean, I had a friend who uh, was sitting in a tavern with her, and she said, "Hey, go out and get my briefcase. I want to give. I got to pay the band." Because they, they, she had forgotten to pay the band, and they came in there looking for their money. So Terry says, "You got the keys to your car?" She says. I don't lock my car. <laughs> Her money, thousands of dollars outside. But anyway, everybody knew it, and these people knew it. Yeah, they knew that she brought her money home. That's, so they were there, lying yeah. in wait, and yeah. just ready to to do it. How much money did they get? Three thousand bucks. All yeah, that for three that grand. Yeah, even, in three, even in seventy six dollars. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not even. That's not no, a lot of money. No. Yeah. So that was kind of the end of the the era, a uh, one era yeah. there, right? Yeah, yeah the yeah. end of the one era. Yeah. So yeah. let's let's kind of go backwards. So we've kind of taken the Tarot family through the Coliseum, so to speak. But let's go back. You, you, you mentioned in Frank Westfall, the biggest band in Chicago, kind of starts this off. Let me. Let, can I tell you a little yeah, story about go, that? Go, go, go. I had to give a talk to a group of elderly people over in Litchfield, and uh, I start out with uh, Frank Westfall. How many of you people have ever heard of Frank Westfall? Not a soul raiser hand, because they've already been past that era. Man. Yeah, yeah. And I and, and I had to equate who he was popular, you know, com, in comparison. They never heard of him. Frank Westfall. He was married to Sophie Tucker. You you know Sophie? Tucker? I don't. Okay. Well, the Madonna of Broadway uh, the Broadway star. <laughs> yeah. 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 Extraordinaire. Of the of the nineteen yeah, teens 20, and twenties. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, this guy was big time, and uh, these people. Said, never heard of the guy. Have you ever heard of Louis Armstrong? Oh yeah. I says, well, he was the equivalent of Louis Armstrong. Okay. You know. <laughs> and, and when I when we mentioned some of the names of the bands that played, and the reason I mentioned the story, is because I want to mention a lot of names, and and, and uh, unless you look them up and and do any kind of a research on them at all, then they're not going to impress you. Some of them won't. Yeah, but they were so popular at the time. Yeah. The oh, best yeah. the best yeah. thing that America had out there played the Coliseum. Well, let's run through some of those. Duke names. Ellington, Duke Ellington, Paul Whiteman with, with Paul Whiteman, the King of Jazz, with his with his group, the, the Rhythm Boys, which featured Harry Al Rinker, Harry Barris, and a very very young Bing Crosby. Oh, really? Bing there. Crosby, that's awesome. Louis Armstrong, yeah. House of David, who played in front of four presidents, right? Got a lot of lot of regional stuff. Charles Creeth, uh, and and one of the interesting thing is, although America was seriously and rigidly integrated or segregated, segregated yeah. They used black acts right off the bat. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right off the bat. I mean, Duke Ellington was black, and that was in the 20s. Charles Creeth from St. Louis. Lionel Hampton. Lionel Hampton played there. I mean, Benny Goodman, the Dorsey Boys, both Tommy and Jimmy in their orchestras, and together played there. Jesus. Guy Lombardo played there. Uh, Glenn Miller? Nope. No? Nope. Everybody thinks that. No, I had that on my little research. That's why well, I asked. And you know, yeah. there are older people who would swear in court that yep. they saw Glenn Miller there. <laughs> we have not been able to find one we cannot find iota that. of evidence that he played there. And when she did her 25th anniversary party, they listed all the big bands that had played there. 1949. Uh-huh. Glenn Miller was not listed. So yeah. I don't think got, got, uh, that Glenn Miller played there. Count Basie? Yeah. Count Basie. Oh, yeah. He played there. Uh, 1950, Vaughn Monroe did the Camel Caravan. Live broadcast from the stage of the coast Coliseum. to coast, coast to coast. Really? Yeah. In the days before uh, TV, that was as big as it got. Two shows: one for the afternoon for the broadcast, close the doors, shovel them out, sweep the floors, open the doors, and one that night for dancing. 
what was it like back then? Was it? I, I mean, <laughs> I, when, I, I, you were talking about when you got there in the '60s. You you got out there when you were 15. Very, you were out there with the youth, really. Yeah. What was in, in the early days though? Was it more of a sophisticated joint, or it was a, you know, yeah, you yeah, take your wife out there for yeah. dinner, and maybe not dinner, but drinks and dancing, and you dressed up, yeah, and the whole yeah. nine yards? In fact, at one time in the, in the mid '30s, 33, I think it was. They tried to label it as a nightclub, you know, with acts and uh, dinners, and you dressed up. You yeah. wore a suit. Uh, it was a big deal. I mean, people came from all over. All over. What What is it about the Coliseum's location that made it so popular? Well, it was on the original Route 66, right? It was right. Route 4. It was Route yeah. 4 before it was 66. And that and back then, they named those highways in the order in which they built them. So Route 4 is the fourth hard road in Illinois. <laughs> and, I didn't know that. Yeah. And it it was started in the teens, and it came through Benell during the yeah. teens. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. where you, we come up with the term hard, hard road. road. Nice. But anyway. The more you know. Uh, so it was, the, it was the only thoroughfare from Chicago to St. Louis, an ideal place for picking a night of the business. Uh, also, Kansas City. There was a three-way... Drive that uh, promoted uh, groups to come to the Coliseum Ballroom. And they would call the managers of the Coliseum to get booked because they knew about this and they wanted to play it. When we were young, it was always toward the end there, a Saturday night deal only. In the early days, if somebody, if Count Basie was coming through from Kansas City on a Tuesday, they'd put him on stage, pick up a cheap routing date. Yeah, so they, if know, they were make some money any night, night, any yeah. night of the week. If they were coming down from Chicago to go to St. Louis, okay, they'd pick up, put them on, on stage on a Wednesday. And, and they draw. And they draw. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, 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 so if, if I were there in 1940 to see one of these acts, what would I have paid? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> compared By comparative prices. Yeah. Buck and a half. Buck yeah. and a half. Buck and a quarter. Something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember seeing those those pricings. We've got ticket stubs from uh, Ray Charles and people like that. And it's like, what, 350 Yeah. Yeah. 75 Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, you talk about Ray Charles, then you're kind of getting into the 50s. Right, sixties, yeah. you know. So the, the big, I, unless you guys tell me wrong, Elvis never appeared. No, the date the date was booked. The okay, date was booked, and it got reske- it got canceled and never got rescheduled. And his 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 career just exploded, and suddenly she couldn't touch him. Yeah, this yeah. would have been in the very early part, very early fifties, fifty five, fifty six, yeah. something like that, when he was just coming out. And she had a chance to get the Beatles in nineteen sixty four. No. Turned them down. Turned them down. Turned they them wanted down. too much. She said she can't make any money. <laughs> and and well, she'd have to charge 10 bucks a head to get people to come there. And it's interesting that when the Beatles played Bush Stadium in 66, the ticket was only 450 <laughs> For 55,000 people. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And it seems like everybody that I know that was alive says they were there. <laughs> yeah. 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 You're right. You're right. So, but who else in the 50s? You'd had Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, of course. Bo Diddley, which yeah. Chubby Jim, Checkers. Jim, Jim met a couple Domino. times. Yeah, Pat's Domino. Yeah. Ike and Tina, uh, Sam the Sham, the Association, the Turtles, Tommy James a couple times. Bobby V. Bobby V. Bobby My Bobby favorite. V. What about the killer? Jerry Lee. He was there. Jerry Lee Lewis was yes. there. Oh, yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. That's my guy. Yeah. When, the, when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame opened, five of the original first class had played the Coliseum. Really? Jerry Lee, Ray Charles, Everly Brothers, oh, and, and, and Chuck Berry, of course. Yeah. Grassroots. So yeah. that, was Chuck Berry Joey there? Joey and the Starlighters. Was, was, the Chuck, was Chuck Berry there a lot just yeah. due to being in St. Louis? And yeah, I mean, he wasn't there 30, 40 times, but he was there. Yeah. Three, four, three, yeah. three times, something yeah. like Four times, I believe he was. Yeah. I got four dates, I think. Yeah. yeah. I've got a sheet, or I've got a booklet of all the groups that have played there from day one, and it's uh, 30 pages long. <laughs> you mentioned meeting sure. some of those folks there. What, what, who's the, what, what's your favorite I, show you ever saw there? I saw Bo Diddley there, and then we went out west to see my relatives in 1980. And my sister, who knew nothing about knows nothing about music, not a, and not into it at all. She says, "You want to go out and see a band tonight?" And I says, "Yeah, okay." We were in Palo Alto. I says, "Sure, yeah." She says, oh, "Let me look, look through the papers." And she looked through. And she says, oh, "San Jose, a band by the name of Bo Diddley's playing." And I thought, "Oh yeah, it's probably some arrangement of a name of his or whatever." Yeah. So we walk in there, and there's a little two foot high stage, and it's about 
10% of the size of the Coliseum, and there's Bo Diddley on stage. And I wait until the first break, and I go up to him and I say, hey, you mind if I ask you a question? He says, no, go ahead, young man. I was in 1980. I was a young man. He said, I said, uh, <laughs> hey, do you remember the Coliseum Ballroom? He says, Benel, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, my point in mentioning that is twofold. Once I get to pat myself on the back. And secondly is a lot of the artists you talk to yeah. love the place. I mean, it was like people who went there mm -hmm. felt about it. That's how they felt about it. We did a uh, telephone interview with uh, Joey D. That on Twist, twist. Joey mm -hmm. D. He was just loved it. Fun. Enamored with the Coliseum yeah. Ballroom. Yeah. Jo you know, Joyce was a character. Yeah. I mean, she was very lively, and she had a personality. Uh -huh. And everybody remembered it. Yeah, she was, she was she was a tough old gal, but she was she was a nice person too, though she was a good person. But she was tough. Had to be to run a place like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. everybody yeah. has got her hand, got their hands in her till. I've heard more than one yeah. story of her yeah. slugging a guy. <laughs> so I mean, yeah. Was, well, then there's a famous Wayne Cochran story. You know who Wayne Cochran was? Mm -mm. Oh, he was like the blonde Elvis. He wore the silly jumpsuits, the bouffant type hair. Okay, yeah. Wayne was a very destructive act. Was taking chairs and smashing them, breaking up tables, and, and they said Joyce just had her hand on her pistol the whole time. Just get ready. <laughs> and at the end of the night, he came to get the money, and she had a big stack of money, and she said, "Okay, this is yours now. This is for the tables. This is for the chairs. <laughs> this is for the curtains. Here's what's left for you. You got ten minutes to get you and your monkey butt out of my building and off my property, and you'll never come back here again." And he, <laughs> they were gone. Ten yes. minutes. Wow. <laughs> that's remember, that's original rock star yeah, stuff. Remember, there. remember Tiny Tim? Yes, uh -huh. he was there. Tiny Tim, yes. Tiny Tim. He had a tiny, tiny audience. He had the <laughs> least least attended show for a national act ever. ever. Really? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That Joyce made a mistake that night. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you talk about all these national acts, you just brought up the least attended. Well, I mean, what was average attendance there for, for a big name? A big, that's what I'm yeah. interested in. For a big in. name, you'd get close to a thousand people. Yeah, maybe more. Yeah. I think I remember seeing Pat's Domino one night, and there were 1,800 people in that place. Johnny Rivers supposedly had the largest with yep. 2,000. Which would have been jammed in yeah. there. Oh, yeah. If you oh, went yeah. up to the bar to get a drink, you got four or five of them because yeah, you, you know weren't coming back. Go back. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah. An average band, an average crowd with, say, a local band like the Jor-Ells or the Bossman or something like that, you'd have five or six. Yeah. Yeah, five six hundred. Five six hundred. Yeah, yeah. which and, is and the, darn good. Yeah, it's too bad though when you're looking from the balcony at a crowd of five hundred, six hundred people. Uh, it doesn't look as impressive as when yeah. there's a thousand or fifteen hundred yeah. in yeah. there. Yeah. But it's a big crowd. Yeah, that's a lot of yeah. people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. Hey, this is Mike Belovich with Remax Alliance. If you're looking to sell your home before you make a decision, we need to talk today. I get homes sold. I will get you results. I think outside of the box. Even if your house is for sale by owner right now and you just have some questions on, hey, Mike, how can I make this work? Call or text me today, 618-292-0293. I am full time. I work seven days a week and I will help you get your house sold. You know, they really can't see how handsome I am, though. <laughs> James Labonte and Labonte Photography are more than just photographers. They're artists. They take great pride in capturing images that you'll be proud to place on your walls for many years for your friends and guests to admire. He's more than just someone with a fancy camera, lights, and software. He'll spend time with you, get to know you, and capture real and authentic portraits of you. For senior photos, special events, weddings, or hey, just some fun family photos you'll treasure forever, go to Labonte Photography on Facebook or LabontePhoto.com. Say cheese. What was it about the building? You mentioned, you know, that was there a the stage in the back? Was the, was it a particularly good sounding room? It was. It yes. was. You know, th these ballrooms popped up all over America. Mm -hmm. You know, when 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 the depression hit, a lot of these record companies had to release their artists. There just wasn't nobody was buying records, right. and they had to go on the road. Well, the record companies. Uh, uh, they didn't like the radio. People can hear this stuff for free. How are they going to buy records? Well, it turned out just to work the other way around to their favor. More people saw the bands live, the more record sales. And these places popped up all over the Midwest. Little ballrooms. There was two or three places in Collinsville, the Castle Loma in St. Louis. There was Collinsville Park Ballroom. There was a Coliseum. There were places in Wisconsin. And they would just, they created a circuit. Mm -hmm. These bands would just go and play these things. And uh, 
That's how you heard music back then. I mean, if you wanted to go dance, that was an activity. You had to go somewhere else to do it. And it was, uh, let's go dancing tonight, honey. Okay. So it was the dance floor and the and the quality of the room sound, yeah. Yeah. really, that made right. it. Everybody's got a story. You know, Jim, when you brought up, maybe it was before we even started recording, that anyone you talk to, you bring up the Coliseum, artists, locals, people that stopped in, sparkle in their eye and it puts a smile on their face because they've all got a story exactly i mean you've probably heard thousands of these things yes, right we have. yes tell me about some of the you know the what are, what are the most common things you hear the woman i married i met her there yeah i pro i proposed to my future wife there yeah yeah uh the I fights that. I got in when I was there, <laughs> you, know, you, hear a, you hear a bunch of those, and then you hear some things you can't even. I want to want. I can't say on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm know, not even talking about the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, every, that's the thing. I think people wax romantic about it, and they say, you know, you know, I met the love of my life there. I met Mister Wright there. I met Miss Wright, but probably a lot of people just met Miss Wright now yeah yeah you bet <laughs> there's a lot of that probably going but on but it sounds good when you say i met her at the coliseum <laughs> yeah, ballroom yeah i have a story about the balcony but i can't tell it <laughs> <laughs> well when we up the rating on this okay. podcast yeah. you come back and you, you know, know we'll, cause we'll we, talk about that we talk about the dances yeah. yeah that it was most well known for but they did a multitude of things over the years yeah. there mm-hmm. at the coliseum they played bingo there on Wednesday nights. They had, they, they had stag shows. They had stag shows. Really? Oh, yeah. But we can't talk about that either. <laughs> and you yeah, just we can. did. <laughs> <laughs> so they put so, the flicks up, huh? No. no. They bring girls oh. out. Oh. And, We're not even talking stag flicks. We're talking they're shows. Talk, they're talking mules from the mine <laughs> and girls. <laughs> and he said there was one guy with a 11-inch <laughs> He, could, he would tie it in a knot, and he remembers he was kind of famous. They had big they crowds put him on for stage. That. Yeah, <laughs> they Superman. Put him on stage. Huh? <laughs> he said he thinks that guy was kind of famous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you mentioned more stuff. You know, what else were they? Were they roller, roller skating? skating? Roller skating. Yeah. yeah, roller skating. On the off nights without bands, they had roller skating. Did they ever do like roller derby and all that they, stuff? They there? had a skating contest. Yeah. I don't know what that consisted of, but they had a skating contest. And we don't know that they served alcohol during those skating sessions. But I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I'd love to have seen it had they done that. 300 drunks on roller skates. They had boxing. They had wrestling. The Benelde High School uh, played their home games there for quite a while. Oh, for basketball. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Benelde had an independent basketball team. It played there, too. That's a, that's a, cuz there were showers in the basement see. It was probably the one place that if you needed a big space you had to use. In 1940 yeah. in 1943 yeah. Benelde had their homecoming there. Yep. Really? Yeah. yeah. I mean they always all had day, it in the park all day all night thing. Was yeah. it a wedding place or Oh yeah, they had yeah. wedding receptions there, yeah. sure. So we, we we get through 76, Joyce is gone. Who takes it over after Joyce? Hiram Franzoy. He was a he carpenter his, by trade. He got his hooks into it and yeah. uh, he lasted about a year and a half. He wasn't successful with it. Uh-huh. He yeah. didn't want to bend. Yeah. He was at that. He was at that point, John, where he was a little older and didn't quite understand the music. Mm-hmm. He thought, "Well, it's all rock and roll, electric. That's all they need." Well, no, that's not all you need to bring a crowd in. You know. Yeah. About a year and a half. About a year and a half. He just finally shut it down. And then Dave Boone came along in 1976, oh, yeah. 77, something mm-hmm. like that. The Dave Boone years. Dave was from Hillsboro. Still is. He lives there. And he brought it back from the dead. I mean, with my help and his manager, Ted, he put the place back on the map again. And we started booking bands in there, and uh, he started advertising. And for about seven, eight years, yeah. seven years, yeah. I mean, he brought the big crowds back right. again, finally. Yeah. And the Chicago Knockers. And the Chicago Knockers. Which and were mud wrestling. Really? And he'd bring in Mama's Pride. He'd bring in, we brought a whole bunch of national stuff in. I was booking bands for him there. Yeah. What was that, male strippers? Yeah, yeah and that was, was my show. That was Michael, <laughs> Michael J. and the Casanova. Did you appear yeah. in that one too, John? No, I didn't appear. I just looked at it. <laughs> yeah. They wouldn't let him. <laughs> that was a great night. We had like 543 women. Ten dollars a head to come in to see the male dancers. It had just been on Donahue, and all these little small town curiosities came. I got girls' there. night out. Yeah, that's what it was. No yeah. men allowed yeah. till after midnight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really. And I got there, and there were a, two buses. Some church group was protesting. No kidding. And they had his driveways blocked. 
So, so you could get, get in. And I went out to him, hey, you can't do this. This man's open for business. You can go across the road and do anything you want. You got to move these buses. You got to move them right now or I'm calling the police and I'm calling Channel 5 and I'm calling Channel 4. The helicopters will be here in about half an hour. And they went across the street. But we had 543 women, I think, at 10 bucks a head that night. I love that you know the exact number, <laughs> even to this day. I was, get, I was yeah. getting paid, you know. <laughs> I, it was my show. I had to know how much was there. But they, those girls were, <laughs> it was a crazy night. It was, you know, it was a crazy Was that one night. of the crazy, you mentioned mud wrestling. You got male strippers. Yeah. What What were some of the most unique events that were there That's besides one of music? Them. That's <laughs> The male they dancers, the, I think, and, yeah, uh, yeah, the, the, and the mud wrestling. And they let the local gals come in and yeah. mud wrestle, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah? Little yeah. grudge matches going on? Yeah. I know one of them. She was a wrestler. <laughs> 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 Boone did well, though. He, he even tried to bring in some yeah. big band stuff on Friday nights. He used to throw money out to the crowd. Yeah. He, yeah. <laughs> what happened was the DUI laws came in. That's when they got serious about enforcing that stuff, about 1981, 82. 83, somewhere around there, and it just ruined the nightclub business. You know, I mean, there were two, there was one way in, one way out, two ways in, two ways out for the Coliseum, and the cops would just, just sit, sit there, there and wait. Just fishing. Yeah. Yeah. But he would put out deli trays to put some food in these people before they got on the highway. Mm hmm. But the cops just decided that we, we don't want this till no. five o'clock in the morning anymore. And they saw to it that it ended. Yeah. And it just ruined the nightclub business. Yeah. So this is this is the early eighties. Yeah. Well, what happened yeah. was the DWI laws came out about the same time that MTV hit, and people were afraid. Uh, the guy at the tug, Barry Tug, he 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 was getting four or five DWIs every time he opened his doors. Yeah. Kill I said, I said, Tom, there are people who are afraid to come here. I'm afraid to come here. If I come here, I'm going to have one beer an hour. That's not what you want. You want me to have two or three in an hour. Yeah. And I said, you know, every time you open your doors, you're getting three or four DWIs. What if you had three or four windshields cracked out? People would stop coming. Same thing. They're afraid to come here. Yeah. I'm growing up. I was there in the late 80s, and it was a cover band. Like, right. run away. Run away. There. That's when Denny, uh, Dennis Terrell had it. Okay. Dennis, yeah, Dennis Terrell. So yeah. it came back to the family? Yeah. Yeah, Dennis was Joyce's mm. great nephew. Great nephew. Let's great see. nephew, yeah. It's her cousin's kid. Yeah. 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 Cats on Holiday played then. That was one of my bands. Runaway played, and uh, I guess that thing. They quit playing there by then. They played there so. quite a bit. Yeah, I, I mean, I remember going there all the way through the, the early '90s, you know, with different things. And you know, it seemed like for you guys, tell me if this is right or wrong, if this changed or not. For me, by the you know Thanksgiving holiday, Christmas time, it seemed like everybody was home. Everybody, and that's when I would always go. And, right, and the biggest crowds are always there. Yeah, those yeah. holiday dates were always yeah. the yep. best. Yep. From its conception. Yeah. Yep. Back in, but back earlier, probably in the 60s and 70s, you, before you're talking about all the DUI laws, and, and, and John, you said you'd went there even in your yeah. early teens. What was it like from the, the, the local high school rivalries? You oh. know, you know, you'd yeah. have the, the Staunton guys and the Benelt guys and the Gillespie guys and the Mont Olive guys. The, they yeah. all had their little spot. What, was yeah. it, so, so was it really that kind of segregated it, to the different towns? And, and it was funny because if you look from the stage, all the Staunton people were over here. If you're on the stage, all the Staunton people were to the Staunton right. Staunton people on the right. As you look from the stage, and then Mount Olive and Edwardsville, and on the other side, close to the stage, you'd have Benelde and Gillespie, uh -huh. and then Litchfield. But it was just the same way that geographically the towns were laid out. Oh, yeah. And then Mount Olive. Mount Olive. <laughs> and then so you'd get some Hillsborough, Litchfield people way, way in the back. Yeah. You know? But it was laid out the same. And you stayed pretty much in your own little And if you went over there to talk to a girl... Was that were you looking for trouble? <laughs> you could. It yeah. could be trouble. Some, yeah. some, some were looking for trouble. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. like my they, buddy. They didn't put up with a lot of baloney in there though. They had bouncers there. Yeah. Yeah. And they bounced. <laughs> well, I remember being in there one night when I saw a friend of mine get hit with a glass pitcher over the head. <laughs> and uh you wouldn't look at it by knowing me now, but I was pretty fast back then. I hit that side door running. <laughs> It was. You it, can always get faster too, right? Yeah. Well, you don't have to be the fastest. You just got to be faster, faster than somebody, somebody else. else. Yeah. So I remember I was standing there one night, and some guy handed me his little Joe. Said, "Hold this, I'm going to the bathroom." I said, "Yeah, okay." Here comes a. I don't know who it was. Maybe Norm or somebody. And he goes, "Come on." I said, "I'm just holding it for a guy." He goes, "Yeah, you know how many times I've heard that tonight." Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Threw me out, and they put me. They had a little. 
little box with three by five index cards, and if you got thrown out, they put your name in the box for how long you were thrown out. Oh, you got to you had to pay a but pay a penance like a certain <laughs> well, amount of time. You huh? can't you, you can't come. I couldn't come back for three months. <laughs> and I came in one night about a month later, and you looked up. They go, "No, you're in the box." How do you remember us all? How do you? There's a thousand people here. How do you remember our faces? You're surprised they just didn't want your money anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, so that gets us through the early '90s. The cover yeah. bands were there. Um, when did it really start to kind of peter that's, off that's in terms of music after, and evolve? After Dennis Terrell had it, a guy named Darwin yep. Bryant got a hold of it, and it was called the American Rock Assembly or whatever the heck it was, and it yeah. just it didn't do well. And that lasted for about six to eight months, and he ran out of money, and then it became an antique mall. And was it ever was it closed for a period of time before that yeah. turned around? Yeah, yeah. For a, not very long though, but I never think. for not, never for very long. So, how did you guys feel about you? You, you grew up loving the place. Oh yeah. And every day you'd drive by it and antiques. Well, what did that make you feel like? Yeah. I was glad that it was being used for something. Yeah, that's true. I wish yeah. it had been a different purpose, but yeah. I was glad that they were using the building for something. Yeah. Right. It, it, it was better to see it being used than having the roof caving in, yeah. Yeah. the broken windows, the birds flying in and out, you know. Right. You drive by now and it's just nothing there and it's just sad. Oh, yeah. It's just yeah. sad. It's just yeah. kind of tugs at your heart a little bit every time I drive by there. But you can see it when you go by. You yeah. See what, you see where it was. Oh, yeah. 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 I see it. And you see it with the yeah. parking lot full of cars. Yeah. And, and all and that. And the cars parked up and down. Up Route, and down. Four. Route 4. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. 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 You're getting and, excited and the, again. Dude. The great yeah. thing about it, everybody you talk to about the Coliseum that was there just speaks of it lovingly. Yeah. yeah. They just loved it. Loved the place. Loved the times they had. Loved the friends they made. Loved the relationships lifelong relationships they made there and, and, and it I, was it was the gathering point for the county it was, sure, yeah. wasn't it and we did get to meet people from yeah. other communities it yeah. wasn't like well you're from carlinville you're from staunton we're not going to talk to you it wasn't it yeah some people were like that yeah. but but by and large everybody got along you know yeah and i don't know how many times you'd hear on monday morning hey where were you saturday night how come you weren't there yeah oh you if know? you weren't there yeah, you were yeah. in trouble you weren't there. where were you where yeah because you? You, you had to be somewhere yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. you could were have been better than the coliseum but you weren't in the place to be right yeah, yeah. so yeah. so it's an antique mall then until july 30 2011 so tell me how that fire started well, everybody claims who knows anything about the fire that it started as an electrical problem in the northeast corner ceiling. Mm -hmm. uh, Eddie Ebert was uh, the drummer that night. I don't know if you know Eddie Ebert or not. Yeah, Eddie. Good friend of mine. He uh, he told me he was playing drums and he looks up in the northeast corner and he sees flames coming out of the ceiling. He said, and somebody yelled, fire, let's get out of here. And he said he picked up one of his drums and by the time he got out of that front door, the place was ablaze. Really? Uh, one, All that old old wood and tar yeah, from the it's room. It's so dry. Oh, yeah. yeah. It just didn't it take like, long. A, like a match and just whoosh. Yeah. See, this big rush of oxygen just being sucked out of that room by that fire. It was unbelievable. So Eddie was playing in the band Shadow of Doubt. Shadow of Doubt. And yeah. that was... As as I think you guys would agree, it was nice that there was a, a concert going on. Right on its yeah. final evening, it was, it was fitting. It was, it yeah. was very fitting. fitting that the place went out in a blaze of glory. Yeah, <laughs> with with a band exactly. playing. with a band playing, and they had a decent crowd there. I think that that evening, I wasn't there. You know where I was? I was shooting a wedding. I was a wedding videographer shooting a wedding in, at the Crown, whatever that is. Plaza. Plaza up in Springfield, and I'd shut my phone off because, you know, when you're shooting video, you don't want uh, the phone ringing. <laughs> and at 10 o'clock, I'd turn my phone off. We were getting pretty close to the end of the reception, and I had all these messages, and I listened to that first one. It says, hey, you got to get here. The Coliseum's burning down, and it was about a two-hour. No, it was about an hour old because it— it just, I think it started about nine in the evening. Something it wasn't, like, yeah, I was yeah, a fireman. Yeah, yeah. I am a fireman here in Mount Olive, and we got paged over. It was around nine-ish yeah, when yeah. that uh, when that first call, call went out. Came, I think yeah. 16 departments. Yeah. yeah, it was big. Yeah. I got there, I got there about one o'clock. We had to break down. We had to, you know, uh, so I didn't get down there till about one in the morning, and I took, brought my camera with me, and I was shooting. The fire was mostly out. They still had a few uh, fire departments still there, and the Route 4 was still closed. Right. But, uh, John, where were sad. you? It was sad. I was producing a murder mystery dinner theater at the in Carlinville at the Glades. Okay, you were up the road then, and yeah. my phone started ringing too. And I called him right away, trying to get him down there with his camera. I didn't know where he was, 
and um, didn't see you at all that night. Not till the next day. We we didn't talk, but yeah, it, I we, we 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 finished our show, and I went down there, and I was we had to park two blocks away just to get near it enough to right. see. Yeah. yeah, it was like somebody was playing there again, almost. And well, uh, lots of people. Yeah, I was I was shuttling water. I wasn't there with a hose sticking yeah. in a window yeah. trying to save the joint. I can't say I was doing any didn't, of that. I heard they drained Pete Drummond's pond too, didn't they? Ah, uh, that might be. I don't know about draining the pond. We emptied out the Benel water tower. And, uh, yeah, we eventually were hooking up the truck, and I think water was rolling back into the system. Oh, okay. It was. It we had basically run out of water. I know we were hauling from some other towns. Don't quote me, yeah. but uh, yeah, eventually they got it to where it was. It was. It was just the burning. Uh, yeah. There was the bricks you know, and the metal left. That was all there was. Here I in the morning going, gee, I wonder if they can build it back up again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I would say this. Uh, having been there in the 80s for some of the big, you know, like Runaway was there on Thanksgiving Eve. You know, it was packed for what I would see it. And to me, that was the biggest crowd I've ever seen in McCoupin County in one place. We couldn't drive the fire truck. Any street we wanted to drive up in and out of Benel. Cars on both, yeah, sides. both sides. It was just pandemonium people all over in the street. Yeah. Uh, the the flames and the embers uh, yeah. were just flying blocks and blocks. Yes, yeah, it were. was crazy. Like I said, I had spots on my shirt and my hat from, and they kept pushing us back and kept pushing us back. They were afraid the the front of the building was just going to collapse. Almost. Yeah. So, so let me ask you this question: you Agree or disagree? That old girl put out one big show that brought the old crowds back like they probably were. And literally went out in that blaze it, of glory. It was a proper Viking funeral. It's like she did it on purpose. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, when I say agree or disagree, are you glad it went out that way? Yeah. Than, than, the, than the way that you described it a minute ago. Yeah, exactly. With windows falling in, the roof. I never, right. Birds. Never, never, never thought yeah. about it that, but yeah, I am yeah. glad, actually. Yeah. I mean, you I would remember, hate to see her just biodegrade and disappear into right. rubble. You know? Trees growing through it. Yeah, yeah exactly. Else. That would no, be I'm glad. Said. I'm glad it went down like it did. Yeah. But but let's talk about the, the aftermath of that. I remember it was, I don't remember if it, how it was said or whatever, but don't go over there and take a brick. You know, oh. and I, but I'm sure <laughs> hundreds of people did, and they've got I a brick. Got lots of bricks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wh- where did they go with all that? Did they just landfill it all, or does somebody have a this, lot of those bricks? You've got a lot. Yeah, I got a, I got a, I got a couple. <laughs> I've got a solid block like that, about the, three of, by three, of the, of the facade. Yeah, and that was different than the yeah. sides. Uh huh. I mean, it's it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> and and at the time, you you you'd mentioned maybe off offline that you know the news was here. It was big oh, news, yeah. Yeah. national yeah. news. Yes, yeah, it was. Yes, it was. And you participated in some of that media back in the day, didn't you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I talked yeah. to three. Uh, well, I talked to channels. KSD, five, K was four, there. And two. KMOV. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. I think Channel Two was there too, weren't they? I think Twenty was there out of Springfield. Yeah. They were there. Yeah, yeah. No, it was. It, it was. I don't know if it was national news, but it was certainly big regional news. Yeah. The documentary that you guys are putting together that was in the process before that fire, right? Yes. yes. When uh-huh. did you actually start this? Oh, I'd back say in the thirties. <laughs> it's still, it's, it's still a work in progress. Yeah. We, we've run out. We run out of money. When did so you we'll start? We'll take it? donations. I'll say around eight, two thousand eight. Yeah. So you were two or three years in gathering. You'd mentioned you'd done interviews. Oh, you know, oh, yeah. We've got yes. we've got such stuff that uh, yeah. And it really started to come after you. You had mentioned uh, earlier. You did a big kind of anniversary of Joyce's death was a yeah. celebration, right? Yeah. And so you you started kind of building toward it. Tell well, me about the celebrations you've had since. We've had a couple of dances uh, at the Gliss Pacific Center uh-huh. in conjunction with Bill Beneld, and they were tributes to the Coliseum Ballroom. Let me go back further than that. We've been doing things in Litchfield with a guy named Chuck Wilson. That's true. At the uh, uh, Moose up in Litchfield. Moose up as we called it. Did, but I think two of them before yeah. we moved it. And, and Chuck uh, was with Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons for a long, 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 long time. And all of us local guys that played in high school bands and stuff, it was just kind of a big jam session. And one year I thought, well, this is the 40th anniversary of Joyce's. Let's move the thing down here, take it to Bill, Bill Burnell, let them put it on. We'll make it a 40th anniversary of the death of Joyce Carroll. We showed our little 12-minute clip we took of just the time that Joyce had it. And mm-hmm. we 
we had a heck of a crowd. Yeah. Yeah. And we, and that's, yeah. a, that's available online. You could find that on yeah, YouTube. You got on YouTube. Yeah. Memories of the yeah. Coliseum. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. get you there. Just Google that. But we had uh, we couldn't had a, have it in Benelde because there was no nope. venue big enough. I was funny. We were we had first when we did there were no advance tickets, and our circuit clerk Mike uh, Mathis called me and said, "What the hell did you do?" You got lines all the way to the police station. I said, yeah, and the other door is just as bad. You can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> we had lines like a block and a half long on each door just to get into that thing. Right. And everybody, the, the hook was that everybody that played that night had played at the Coliseum Ballroom at one time or another. So it was just a big, for all of us old rock and roll guys from the 60s, we just put together a big jam session. It was, it was, a, it was a happy night. Was, everybody yeah, had night, a ball. Yeah, it was a great everybody night. Everybody had a ball. That's great. When are you going to do another one, you know? So... We're going to have to do another one. We're going to have to do another one, yeah. What's the status of the documentary today? Oh, we're about 70% done with it. Yeah, something like that. What do you need to finish it? We need to get some more uh, stock footage, Mm -hmm. and and that costs money. Yeah? You just can't say, can I use that? (laughs) Really? Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yeah, take it. Take what you want. You know, they don't do that for us. Our our, uh, narrative is all done. We've That's down. Jim narrated it and did a great job. I narrated the... uh, one on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And go out there. If you're listening, Memories of the Coliseum, search for that on YouTube. We'll put a link to it in yeah. the show cool. notes so people can find it easily. But is it a funding issue at this point? You just yeah. got to scrape some money yeah. to, to get Pretty it done? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. Yes. So if, you, if you're out there and you're listening and you want to help these guys, get a hold of you. Jim Marcacci. Get a hold of Jim Marcacci. And Jim Marcacci at gmail.com. And, uh, and get this thing done. Yeah, I mean, that'd be... I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> it's always about funding, isn't oh, it? Yeah. 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 It's yeah. all about money. It's all about getting it done. Some of the questions we got when I posted we were going to be doing this episode out there Uh-oh. is... Uh, Any other questions? Is, is, is like three people. I know Josh Laurent was one of the first ones that could ask, so I'll credit him with this. And, and I think I know the answer. A lot of people want it rebuilt. Is it going to be rebuilt? Nope. Don't think so. Yeah. I mean, it would take $2 million to put that building up again, wouldn't it? At least. You couldn't get people to go there anymore. Uh, You got to go there and not drink. The times are too different now. Yeah. Yeah. The Coliseum was always for young people. And back then, you didn't have any place. If you wanted to dance, you had to go out of the house to do it. You couldn't just roll up the rug in the floor. You had to go. And, you know, it was the banjo and that new miraculous radio invention. Mm -hmm. Today you'd have you know you got to you'd have to deal for a 15, 16 year old crowd. Yeah, and you're competing with a lot of other things too. Exactly, a lot more ways yeah. for people, young people, to be entertained now than there was yeah. back in 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950. Yeah, so the the it's not going to be rebuilt. But what would you like to see there? Coliseum. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's an honest answer. Yeah. yeah. What do you think is possible? I mean, put a band shell up. You know, I know uh, that's been floated. Uh, we, yeah. There's been some talk about that. Yeah. And you know, just like have... a civic type, a civic center type thing where you could have different functions and then occasionally you could have a band there, yeah. you know? Yeah. I mean, it's not something you could do every weekend and make a living. So it, 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 something could be put there and put to use multi-purpose activities. Yeah. Okay. Weddings. I just don't think Benel, City of Benel has the finances or the interest to do something like that and maintain no. it right now. And then somebody's going to have to put it up with private sure. money, yeah. Yeah. which is it probably there. Yeah. And as you mentioned, the reason it was built where it was on that hard road for was because that's where the traffic was. Right. That's where the people were. Yeah, it, that's right. it, it was, Route 4 it, is not that no. avenue anymore. No, you got too many other good ones. No, yeah, it, was, no. it was timing and location in spades. It really yeah. was. Yeah. I mean, everything. Perfect storm. Yeah, everything just fell into place perfectly for him. Had a great story, a great history. Sure. Speaking of history, Sarah Zubermeyer wanted to know, did they find any of these supposed tunnels? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, John, I was going to tell you today, I talked to a guy by the name of Ed Zarr, whose uncle was Benny Leewright. Okay, yeah. And Benny Leewright owned the, the, twins, the twins across the road, which was across the street from the Coliseum. And one of the big rumors was that there was a tunnel leading from the Coliseum Ballroom to the Twins, so that if uh, the Twins got raided, the gals would go down into the tunnel, go over to Coliseum, dance, my butt, you know, have a good time, never get caught. Well, and I, and I, the windup. Yeah, and the windup was in the other that place. That was on the, the south side of okay. the Coliseum. I asked, I called him up today, I forgot to tell you, I asked him, I said, hey, was there any truth to that tunnel? He said, tunnel, what tunnel? I said, between the Coliseum and the Twins. He said, I said, you know, the one down in the basement. He says, 
Well, he just didn't have a basement. <laughs> <laughs> so the tunnel story, he says total there, myth. He says you know, we, don't, we don't know for sure because Dennis Carroll, he said, you know, when he took it over, he said, I had a lot of work on that building. If there's a tunnel, I missed it. Yeah. But I won't mention his name because he refused to be interviewed for a documentary. He's in the he's grand security out there. He said he was all through those tunnels. It was like a maze. Really? So we don't know if they existed or not. There may exist. have been one between the Coliseum and the windup. But that was across the parking lot. Right. That not was that, underneath a highway. Right. That was from the front door of the Coliseum. It was just south. Straight south. At the, at the, at the edge of the parking lot. And that building, gotcha. that building was owned by uh, Dominic Terrell. Yeah. Yeah. As well. So. And yeah. my, my stepmother's dad, when he was alive, told me that back in the 30s, the police would go in there with axes and chop down those fake walls and get those prostitutes out of there at the windup. Oh, yeah. And Ben Terrell, who was Dominic's brother, told one of the employees that worked there that in the 30s and 40s, they'd raid the places and the girls would jump in the tunnel, come up to the Coliseum and get mingled up in the crowd, and the cops couldn't tell who was who. Couldn't prove anything. <laughs> so, you know, there's pros and cons. So there's, there's, there's proof that it existed and proof that it didn't exist. <laughs> yeah. So, so we can't think? say for sure. No. no. We can't say for sure. No. Another question we got from a Jennifer Miller. Wanted to know if Al Capone kept his sugar there in the basement. You just said there is no basement. Well, so. there's no basement at the Twins. There was a basement there at the Coliseum. There was a basement at the Coliseum. Very, oh, okay. under, very under small. The, under the stage. Under the stage. Just under the stage. And, and, and the rest of it was just slab. Yeah, there was a furnace room and a shower room. Furnace room, room the shower room, yeah. and it was under the and stage. No, there was no room for sugar. No room for sugar. <laughs> so that answers but they, that. But, he, but, he, but they could have put him in the uh, tunnel. Yeah. Because Dennis Terrell said, you know, back then they had stills out there, and... Uh, that was a new part of town back then, and you could see all the way, and the cops would come, you hear the sirens, and they're coming like a mile, to maybe two miles an hour. <laughs> yeah. And they had time to on move. On porpoise. <laughs> had time, yeah, on porpoise. They had time to move the stuff, and they never got caught. Yeah. So they could have used those tunnels for, for stills. I don't know if they should. The Coliseum well, never got raided. No. As far as we can tell, though, the Coliseum ballroom never got raided. Never got raided in terms of... Looking for booze or yeah. uh, prostitutes or gambling. Yeah. What haven't I had all three you guys? Oh, you know, they. This is interesting. In 1924, the height of prohibition, they had a three-act play called "The Old Soak," <laughs> and it was about alcohol. They had it at the Coliseum. Uh -huh. <laughs> so Dominic Terrell was still alive in 1924. That took a lot of guts to put on a play and go. Yeah. yeah. The old soak. <laughs> I'll tell you a great story. I played there in the band on Thanksgiving night. And we had a girl singer in the band. It was me and a girl up front singing. And uh, Thanksgiving, everybody's home from college, you know, and everybody's, by 8 o'clock, grandma's making you crazy. Uncle Tony's drunk again. You're out the door to your Coliseum. <laughs> it was about 10, 10.30. And we're up on stage. In the corner of my eye on this side, I, I, I Jackie kind of went down on one knee. And I looked over, and she's coming back up, and she had a turkey leg. A turkey leg. Somebody had snuck a turkey leg, a big one, in to the Coliseum, and from the dance floor just took it and flipped it and hit her in the side of the head. <laughs> and she had a bruise <laughs> on her forehead here for a couple of days. But I mean, she had this. Did thing. you cry foul? <laughs> oh, oh, hey, she yeah. had, Johnny's funny. <laughs> she had this turkey leg, and she's looking at me. You know that that Benny Hill look. <laughs> like a dog looking at a June bug on a TV screen. Just what in the hell? And our drummer, Johnny, got laughing so hard he fell off the drum stool. We had, we had a, what else, guys? Uh, all night dances. Yeah. They had all night dances. They had pajama dances. Pajama dances. No. Comedy how, dances. How shocking would that have been to have yeah. a come pajama in, in pajamas in the 20s? Yeah. That was risque now. That would have been, yeah. oh my gosh. Halloween dance. Mock New Year's Eve yeah. dance in July. <laughs> so, yeah, Bob, do you even remember the Coliseum? Well, I was going to say, when we're all talking about this, I only remember it as an antique ball. Yeah. Which is crazy. Bob's 20. I'm okay. 20. Yeah. That's okay. So, yeah, I, that's, I'm not going to hold that against you. I mean, it's just crazy <laughs> to hear, like, the history, their point of view, your point of view, and then how, how it's colored you go for all you. The way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. kind of cool. A lot of years. It was a place to be on Saturday night. Yeah. It was the place to be and be seen. And, uh, you know, I, uh, my girlfriend in high school was from Litchfield, and she was a year younger than I was. So back then, I she was 15, I was 16. And I'd have her mom made her have, have me bring her home at 11 so I could get home by midnight. I didn't ever really have a curfew. 
So I'd drop her off in Litchfield. I'd hightail it down for that last hour at the Coliseum, and she'd get so angry at me. I said, hey, you do it if you get away with it. You know you would. And she goes, yeah, I know. <laughs> You're still dating her. <laughs> Actually. Actually. <laughs> You know, as we wrap this up, what are the, what are the things you would want people to remember about the place that never saw it in any of those eras? The music, yeah. You know, yeah, that's that's what it was all about—the music yeah. and the people yeah. that went there. Yeah, you could have all the bingo games and all the wrestling and all the boxing. You can just discount all that because it was all about the music. Because yeah. that's it. You know, the only way we found out about bingo, boxing, wrestling, and some of the other stuff was by reading about it in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. Really, nobody talked about it. Mm-mm. It was all about. Yeah, you just look at having you know, this. Time. The bands and the orchestras that played there part of the American fabric of, of popular music, right? You know, yeah. I think had Elvis played there, and I think had she taken the Beatles, I think the Coliseum and Joyce Terrell would be a standalone exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Wow, that's yeah. saying something. Yeah. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough for coming by. Yeah, you can. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll, can. You'll, you'll get our invoice. And, <laughs> you'll get yeah. your invoice. But uh, honestly, one of the big interviews I've been wanting to conduct, I'm glad we finally hooked up and we're able to get this oh. done. People wanted to hear this story. Good. I think that's it's good. amazing. That's good. Um, we're going to have you back. You know, we were talking for everyone that's listening, if you're still listening. We're going to get you guys back because there's a whole other thing to talk about just around but no. And we know all about it. And we're going to do talking about that. But you can't talk about Bunnell without the Coliseum. You can't talk about the Coliseum without talking about Bunnell. So we've talked about the Coliseum. And there's the next chapter that we will conduct at some point. We'd love point. to come back. Well, John, is there anything you want to talk about that next chapter? Well, the next chapter, we're in the meantime, before we get this done, I'm trying to do a book called The Wicked City in America, talking about Benel and the gangsters and the bootlegging and uh, all the lawlessness that was going on. And, and we, in uh, 1931, uh, Bookersham Report reported that Benel was the wickedest city in America, even worse than Chicago. Well, well, Chicago got all the press and all the notoriety. It was even worse right down here. They killed people out in, main, on, in broad daylight, and uh, the cops, the state's attorney, wouldn't do a thing about it. Yeah. We'll hear all about that on an upcoming episode. But, but guys, I want to thank you really a whole lot. Did you have fun? Oh, yeah. It's a blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can come back anytime. I'd rather be in front of a camera. I'm, I'm not, a, I don't have the radio face. You know, I got <laughs> TV face. You know. uh, you're a good looking man. Yes, you are. <laughs> thank you. Thank right. you. I was waiting for that. Take this care. This was fun. Guys. Thanks, John. You got it. It was Take a blast. Care. It was really a blast. All right. Uh, wow. Great interview. I want to thank both those guys. And as you hear, probably going to have him back on at some point as, as as we were talking in there you know so much of the story of the benel coliseum has to do with the story of benel itself and you heard john talking about a book that he is putting together called the wickedest city in america as soon as that comes out and they're coming back over and we're going to talk all about you know the benel and the organized crime and how it all ties together and all the other things that happened because as he said you can't talk about the coliseum without talking about benel so we want to talk about benel next so you also heard that the documentary is kind of at a 70% state. And the, something I'll tell you that, you know, may be happening as you're listening to this, but not at showtime. We kind of talked a little bit after that, and they're, they're probably going to set up some type of GoFundMe page. Um, if that happens, we'll, we'll talk about it again here on the show. It is something that they're kicking around to trying to get that thing done. I think that, you know, with listeners like you, and if you want to see that documentary in its finished form, I think it's uh, it's something that maybe you'd want to take part in as well. Don't know what their model is going to be. Don't know what the donation is going to be. But just watch this space if they do happen to have a GoFundMe set up for the Benel Coliseum documentary. I think that will be awesome. In the meantime, like I said, uh, at the opening, if you go out on YouTube, search Memories of the Coliseum, you can see a 12-minute part. What they said in the show, that was just the era that Joyce Tarot had the Coliseum. So that's the era that uh, that they kind of cover there. It's just it was just a great story. I mean, you think about all the national acts that came through. And, and, and you know, they didn't even name all of them. I mean, some of the acts that, you know, we didn't even talk about. People like ACDC, the Allman Brothers, you know, were there. Johnny Paycheck. How about that? Johnny Paycheck. Ted Nugent, the Amboy Dukes, Styx was there. Edgar Winter, REO. All those acts that we didn't even mention in the show, you know, at some point appeared on the stage at the Coliseum Ballroom. That's just amazing to me. Great, great, great episode. Can't thank those guys enough. and can't wait to have them back. 
So just one final thing to do here on the on the show. Let's get my friend Greg Shively on the phone. Greg, as you know from that Cuban episode, is a world traveler. And a few years back, he and his wife went to Italy, and he visited the actual Colosseum in Rome. And I want to hear what that was like. It's got to be an amazing uh, thing uh, to see. Certainly, it still stands while our Colosseum doesn't. So let's get Greg on the phone here and really talk hey, about... Hey, talking yet? What? Time to wrap it up. Come on, man. All right, Greg. Bob says no once again, so I guess that's going to be it for this show. Again? This has been the What's That Like podcast. I've been your host, John Knowles. Peace out. What's That Like is available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Search for What's That Like. Subscribe today and never miss an episode. Streaming is available at SoundCloud.com and on the SoundCloud app. Follow What's That Like at Facebook.com slash What's That Like podcast. And on Twitter at What's That Like Pod. All opinions of the guests of the What's That Like podcast are their own, not necessarily the views of the host or the podcast producers. We hope you enjoy this podcast serving Central Illinois and beyond. Peace out!